don't know. I'm in the dark today, I guess. I like being in the dark in some of the videos. Okay, uh, before we uh, get into today's topic, I would like to um, just give the background of where we are in the semester. I, um, uh, so one to four, we did that about globalization. Some reasons of impacts of globalization, we're seeing more. If you guys were in class, we could talk about globalization a lot because of the corona situation. There's a lot to, to connect now to this system, you know, it's the uh, supply chains, right? If you have all the countries in the world, they're all connected to each other. And in order to get masks, for example, you need to have a factory in your own country in order to get them. If you don't have a factory in your own country, <clears throat> you don't have access to certain materials, which is what we were talking about way, way back in, uh, for protectionism, back in maybe week four. So, um, uh, I just want to go for where we're at so you can see. So then we did free trade agreements. That was the second thing that we did. And branding and, and uh, marketing of uh, global uh, in a global situation, global context. And we skipped over this, which is where we're coming back to right now. So we went up to seven, eight <clears throat> weeks, nine and ten. We looked at uh, innovation. So this would be week number <clears throat> I don't know, eleven, I guess. Um, so we skipped ahead to 11 and 12, and now we have to go, so that was about innovation, and now we have two more parts we need to cover before exams. We're already getting towards the end of the semester. Um, the topic I want to look at today is called uh, Strategic Alliances. <coughs> it's chapter 7 in the book, uh, page 43. Strategic alliances. I will be putting some handouts up on the classroom, um, which also has to do with the minimizing risk and export strategies, for example. And then the last thing we have to do is we have um, change management. Companies have to change when they uh, when they go into the market and they develop. They're internal. We talk about the external strategies, the marketing strategies all the time. This is the internal uh, issues that have to do within the company in order to deal with change. And that takes about two weeks. So by the end of the next four weeks, we'll be done with all the content. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if we're going to have exams on time. I'm really not sure about that. I would say we're not, if I had to guess probably have to have them later um, and then so I'll do a couple review lessons maybe I'll go back and I'll film something for weeks one and two so you have a complete set of semester one topics to review um, so we just have two more topics and, and to go through uh, it's been weird it's been a weird semester um, okay, so <clears throat> last class or last video, I just introduced the idea of the different ways that you can enter a market and I showed the strategies involved. That was the, uh, I believe it was, what was the name? Anyway, um, it wasn't the Ansoft matrix, it was a different strategy thing. Anyway, I put the video up. But there was another video that I also liked, that I also put up, <coughs> excuse me, that, um, uh, that I want to look at at the beginning of this class. So, uh, strategic alliances. Alliance means a partnership, 
and the partnerships that you can have are going to be necessary for you to enter a new market, for you to be able to establish yourself. I mean, maybe you're completely independent. Maybe you don't need anybody. You have deep pockets. You have a lot of money, huge amount of money to throw at a problem that no matter how bad or how long or how difficult it is, you have enough money to, to, to solve a problem. You don't need any help. It's possible, I guess, but it's uh, probably more likely that it'll be more efficient, that you'll be able to do it better and quicker and cheaper if you have some kind of partnership, alliance with someone. Um, so uh, the alliances can be, I mean, we, we've already talked about some relationships between businesses like outsourcing. Outsourcing is a kind of alliance. Um, in this case, uh, and, and, and if you remember, outsourcing has, can be done on many different levels, right? We have the levels of market research. You could hire somebody to do that. Um, you could hire someone to do the advertising. You could hire someone <clears throat> to be the, the personnel department of your company to, to look for staff. You could outsource production, which is what we usually think of when we think of outsourcing. We could outsource our legal costs, our accounting. We can outsource almost any part of our business that's non-essential to our core success. So <clears throat> that's a kind of alliance, right? You find a partnership with someone who can do part of your functions. These are called the functions of the business. Um, and we're all familiar with exporting. <clears throat> exporting to other countries means that you have to work with the importer in that country. So you export to them, they import. Um, there are some legal issues with that and taxation issues. Um, we can get together with a company that's already in a country and they're already doing business on the ground in that country, um, like a, a retail chain. And we can sell through that. We can use distribution channels as uh, an alliance. We can uh, enter a market by uh, making a, some kind of partnership to produce things and also branding. Like Heineken keeps their brand, but they produce in Vietnam. <coughs> so, well, I think what they did is, if I remember, Heineken bought, <coughs> excuse me, bought a brewery here uh, from Saigon Beer, if that's right. And so, you know, they just bought a factory from a competitor. They still operate both brands, but they were able to uh, find a way to operate in the new country without having to create a whole new factory. They could use a factory that was already existing. That's a strategic alliance. That's a, a or, or an acquisition. Um, you can get together with a company that is a local company, and you can invest with that company into a project that both of you are interested in. <clears throat> um, again, it comes up to risk. How much risk you want to take? That's called a joint venture. Uh, one of the more, uh, the bigger style alliances is called a merger. <clears throat> a merger is when two companies go together to form one company. Now, this doesn't happen very often, especially between countries, but one example might be uh, airlines, right? Airlines want to increase their network. So if they see a local small airline, they might also want to, well, or I don't know, they'll buy it. That's an acquisition. Or maybe they'll merge. Usually a merger happens when two companies are the same size. They don't, it's, it's, otherwise one just, you know, big fish eats the little fish. So um, <clears throat> those are some of the examples of the kinds of strategic alliances uh, in our <clears throat> syllabus here, when it talks about 
um, it says rationale. Rationale is meaning the benefits for rationale for. I saw this on a test recently. Rationale. Rationale means the reason for, or let's say the justification for some alliance. Why do we choose that alliance? So it could be, for example, cost. Um, <clears throat> and the benefits of what you get from this alliance. And then they want to look at the different kinds of alliances there. They really should include exporting too. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about all of them. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know. Today, a little bit dry. Not too bad, but a little bit dry. Um, all right. So the rationale for the rationale for uh, is that you are going to want to uh, make more money. <laughs> You, know, you want to understand the market quicker, you don't have the expertise in that market. So what I'll do is I'll go through a video that I like, um, partially, that gets into the thinking about the decision that you're going to go into what kind of situation, what kind of alliance that you would want to have. So we can keep, into, uh, keep, keep in mind again that you have the most basic uh, alliance, you use uh, Amazon to sell something in another country. Right? That's at the far end. You use Amazon as a distributor, you sell. Of course, you have additional costs because um, shipping, etc. Second, a formal, a very formal export relationship. You have someone in the country and you have some agreement that they will be the one to import your products for you and possibly sell them, which leads to a situation where maybe you have an agent or you have a license that you sell to somebody to be your go-to, your specific agent in that market, <clears throat> uh, which leads to the possibility if you're a retail shop or a service that you franchise. Again, you hire someone in that uh, country or they pay for the right to use your name and reputation, quality control, brand, products, <clears throat> but they operate based on their local knowledge. And then you get to the point where you're going, okay, franchise, you want to uh, go from one more step from there, is that you buy a local player. You acquire, it's an acquisition. You acquire the local player in order to uh, enter the market. The local players got experience, they've got uh, facilities, they've got employees, they've got all these things in place to help you. Um, on another level, you can merge with another company, but that creates all kinds of management issues and uh, mergers are quite complicated. Uh, and, and it's hard to see the benefits. Most mergers don't really add much. And then you go to um, the level where you, uh, well, joint venture, which is better than a merger in many ways because uh, when you have a joint venture, you separate, you, you, you take some capital from your company and you mix it with the capital from a local company, say a Vietnamese and American company, or in the subway example, someone's building a subway, it's a Japanese plus a Vietnamese company investing. Uh, so that money goes into a project or uh, one idea and it doesn't mess up the home companies. The home companies are still separate from that, so that could be successful. And then the last and most intense way of investing in a new country is to directly invest, is to build your own shops, build your own brand, do everything yourself. Okay, so you have this very basic, enter the market through selling through Amazon or Facebook marketing all the way to building shops and factories yourself. So there's many different levels of entrance. So we talk about the rationale, the choice. Why would you choose one over another? Okay? So in this video we'll look at some of the reasons 
And in the video, they also call these differences, so it's entry mode. It's entry mode means how you enter the market. And they're going to compare something called um, uh, they call it this here, they call it uh, <clears throat> externalization, which means that you start from the basics, right? So you just export or you just send something uh, to the country. You don't get involved in the infrastructure. Whereas internalization means you go into the market, you put your money down in that market for a long-term investment. So. This is the same thing I'm talking about. Some factors, rationale, indicate a move in which direction. So depending on what's happening or what kind of business you have, then it's going to determine the kind of limits of how much you want to actually set up in that country versus just sell to that country. So this video is pretty good in that. <coughs> Entry mode decision. I will break it down for you. Break it down, yo. Organizations entry mode. However, before when organizations enter foreign markets, they make decisions about what kind of marketing an organizational setup to choose. As marketers, we talk about making decisions about an organization's entry mode. However, let us make the third call for this video. understand what an entry mode decision is and how it's connected to the rest of the internationalization process. Secondly, why this decision is important. And subsequently, how we can go about making an informed choice by looking at some of the factors that influence our decision. We will also provide an overview of the different entry modes available for us to choose between. So let us begin. So how is the entry mode decision connected to the rest of the internationalization process? When an organization goes from marketing their products and services only on the home market to also target one or several foreign markets in different countries or regions, we talk about an organization's internationalization process. The internationalization process starts with the choice of which foreign markets to target. We call this the market selection process. Ultimately, we will define our marketing mix, the four or the seven P's, for the foreign market. The marketing mix we use on the foreign markets may vary to the one. All right, so uh, as far as these go, the strategic alliances, of course, they include the entire marketing mix at some point, but mostly they include distribution strategies and promotional strategies. Uh, product adaptation or standardization we talked about already, uh, pricing strategies and positioning, uh, very relevant, but not really for this. We're talking about entering the market. How do you set up your distribution system and in that way, um, and even, yeah, even promotion, you know, promotion is linked to it. <clears throat> in the sense of cost <clears throat> and understanding customers in that market but but it's mostly about this is mostly about how you get your products into the market it's a lot of distribution it's a lot of place <clears throat> choosing the market <clears throat> we use on the home market we would address issues regarding standardization and or adaptation of the marketing mix However, before deciding on the marketing mix, we need to address how to organize our entry to the foreign market. We discuss which entry mode to use, and many factors will influence our decision. Choice of entry mode is what we will address in this video. So why is choice of entry mode important, and how can we go about making the right choice? Let us use an example. This French business located just outside of Paris produces French cakes and desserts. All right, it's a bakery. <clears throat> it's a French bakery. They want to enter another European market. In these modern production facilities, well-educated confectioners develop recipes and create delicious cakes and desserts 
ready to be sold and distributed to cake-loving customers. The cakes and desserts are frozen immediately after production and are then distributed to a variety of catering companies, restaurants and cafes around France. So what might impact French cake's choice of entry mode to a foreign market? French cake's internal situation will have an impact. Some external factors about the particular country, region and market of choice will influence that decision. Some conditions related to possible outsourcing of activities are addressed in transaction-specific factors. And finally, French cake's preferences for the different characteristics of the various entry modes will also affect their choice. As we will address these four sets of factors for French cakes, we will use this visual to indicate in which direction the different factors are pointing us. Some factors might indicate a move towards internalization. In other words, that using a hierarchical mode is appropriate. Other factors might indicate that a move towards externalization using an export mode is more suitable. And some may indicate a more moderate approach and thereby point in the direction of an intermediate mode. So let us apply this visual to our example with French cakes as we address the four sets of factors. French cakes have set their eyes on the UK. Okay, this is what I would take notes on, the four kinds of factors. Okay. And their initial idea is to enter the country by setting up a sales and production subsidiary in the UK. The characteristics of hierarchical modes are high setup costs. All right, so just to understand this video better, <clears throat> they're starting with the idea of the most costly, um, so if they say hierarchical mode, that means that they want to keep it all, all inside the company, company direct investment. So the company is going to go and open shops in the UK, find a place, rent the place, renovate the place, design, fit it out, everything. So, they would create a subsidiary and that would, uh, of course, that would lead to high costs, of course. It's the most expensive way to enter the market. Um, high risk because of that cost. Low flexibility. Once you commit the money, it's hard to get the money to uh, change your strategy, right, in the middle of your choice. Um, and last one is, uh, but you have high control, right? Nobody else can tell you what to do. If you don't have a partner, then you have freedom. A production site and sales force carry a large investment. High risk, as there is no guarantee that the initial large investment will pay off a low level of flexibility, as the large investment will make it difficult to quickly pull the plug on the UK adventure, should business not prove to be as successful as hoped. A high level of control, as French cakes would hold on to complete ownership of all value chain activities, being in the position to make all decisions about target groups, distribution channels, and so forth. Let us address the first set of factors, the internal factors. Let us use this visual as we evaluate French cake's internal factors. And let us see if this will indicate a move towards internalization as French cakes are considering. French cakes is a small company. Their resource availability is low, and therefore a large investment would be risky. They have no international experience. Making use of an external partner's expertise might prove advantageous. The cakes and desserts are not technically complex. And although their cakes and desserts are good, French cakes doesn't carry a large product differentiation advantage in terms of, for example, bread. So this is the questions they're asking themselves about whether or not they should just directly invest in the other country. Uh, the company size is small, so they don't have a lot of capital, for example. So that's a little bit more risky. Uh, they don't have enough international experience, so uh, maybe they're nervous about that, uh, trying to, uh, you know, whether or not their products are, they need market research. 
Uh, product complexity is low, so they don't really need any special ingredients or anything. So that's possible. Uh, but they don't have a huge differentiation between what they do and what's in the market. So if they had a clear competitive advantage or some kind of pool promotion or something where people knew about them or French was special in some way, that would probably give them a greater reason to go into that market. So most of these reasons are saying, no, it's not probably a great idea to put so much money in. Branding niche. An evaluation of French case internal factors has revealed an indication towards externalization and not towards internalization as French case initially suggested. French Cakes also has another suggestion. Meet Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson is a UK-based agent. He would be happy to represent French Cakes and sell their products to appropriate intermediaries around the UK. So this is a different level, right? So this is uh, export, or I'm sorry, importer. Mr. Thompson, he's an importer. <coughs> so we could allow him to import our cakes. This is at the, 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 the soft entry level, like the very basic level. Using Mr. Thompson would be using a direct export mode. The characteristics of export modes are low costs, as French cakes would not need to sell any facilities, staff production, or hire staff. Low risk, as the investment is low, French cakes will not be taking a great risk with this setup. A high level of flexibility. As the ties to the UK market will be limited, it would be fairly easy to pull the plug on the UK adventure, should business not prove to be as successful as hoped. But also a low level of control. French cakes will have little control about how Mr. Thompson markets and sells their cakes and desserts. Will he choose appropriate sales channels? Might he favor possible competitors due to a more advantageous commission rate? And will you miss opportunity? Alright, so to look at what their choices are in terms of what's going to happen if they export, uh, lower cost, right, which means lower risk, uh, higher flexibility, we can pick the products that we want to sell, maybe we can uh, find specific parts of the market that are interesting for our products. Um, but the problem is low control. We don't really know what Mr. Thompson is doing in that market. We have to trust him about what he's doing. Uh, and we also have to pay him, so actually we get less income. All right, so there's Mr. Thompson again. Is that French cakes would have been able to take advantage of if they had their own sales staff in the UK. Let us address the second set of factors, the external factors. These are factors that address the foreign market of interest, in our case, the UK market for cakes and desserts. Let us use the same visual as before as we evaluate the UK market for French cakes and see if they indicate a move towards French cakes' second suggestion of using an agent. Although the UK is geographically close to France, research will tell us that the social cultural distance is considerable. This would indicate that having a partner with local knowledge could prove to bridge this gap. Okay, so they're talking about factors that may influence your choice to use an agent for exporting or importing. Um, the distance between the cultures is so different that it might be helpful to have someone who understands the market. Uh, also, they might understand demand and the size of the market. Uh, they might have an idea about how to deal with customs and trade barriers and uh, how, you know, what's the best way to, uh, to, to import. Intensity of competition, they might understand the competitors better and also this part, intermediaries. Those people are the suppliers and the distributors and the ways that you can for example, get the product in the supermarkets. So you don't know any of this. You're outside of the country, so. French case have researched the UK market and concluded that the market is of a decent size 
and that it is growing at a moderate pace. Currently, there are no trade barriers standing in the way of exporting goods to the UK. French cakes have discovered that the competition is intense. This would add to the level of risk should they wish to use a hierarchical mode. Therefore, this indicates a move towards externalization. Research has also shown that there are a large number of relevant intermediaries available. Mr. Thompson is just one of many options in this field. Although the market has experienced growth, Brexit is believed to cause some general instability and uncertainty in the market. So, an evaluation of the external factors has also revealed an indication towards externalization. This supports French Cake's second suggestion of using an agent. French Cakes are still considering both options. One, a sales and production subsidiary, and two, an agent. The decision isn't made until a thorough investigation of all four sets of factors have been carried out. Some factors might prove to be a showstopper, making other factors less important when making the final decision. So let us move on to the third set of factors, the transaction-specific factors. These address to what extent outsourcing, i.e. using an independent partner to carry out certain functions, is advantageous and safe. Let us use the same visual as before as we evaluate and see if they indicate a move towards French cakes first or second suggestion. The know-how and product benefits connected with the cakes and desserts are not considered difficult to transfer and explain to an independent partner. French cakes consider it unlikely that an independent partner will show opportunistic behavior. Marketing and selling their cakes and desserts will not reveal secret recipes. So, an evaluation of the transaction-specific factors has also revealed an indication towards externalization. Let us move on to the fourth and final set of factors, the desired mode characteristics. We will evaluate French Cake's wishes in terms of the main characteristics of the different types of entry modes. French Cakes have expressed that they can't afford to be too risky. They have no desire to be in complete control of the operation. They see the UK adventure more as a first and trial and error step in their internationalization process. Therefore, they are also very keen on a high level of flexibility so that they are able to pull the plug on their UK adventure should business not prove to be as successful as hoped. An evaluation of these and the other three sets of factors indicate a move towards externalization which support French Cake's second option of using a UK opportunistic behaviour. Uh, this part is a little bit harder. Yes. One, a sales and production subsidiary. And two, an agent. The decision isn't made until a thorough investigation of all... Right, so we're either going to enter or invest. All four sets of factors have been carried out. Some factors might prove to be a showstopper, making other factors less important when making the final decision. So let us move on to the third set of factors, the transaction-specific factors. These address to what extent outsourcing, i.e. using an independent partner to carry out certain functions, is advantageous and safe. Let us use the same visual as before as we evaluate and see if they... Notice it's safe to outsource, right? If I was going to outsource like making phones for Apple, I might worry about my uh, intellectual property, for example, right? Does this bakery have to worry about uh, intellectual property? Mm, probably not, but maybe. So that's what they mean here, like the know-how. That means the intellectual property. Indicate a move towards French cakes first, or second suggestion. The know-how and product benefits connected with the cakes and desserts are not considered difficult to transfer and explain to an independent partner. French cakes consider it unlikely that an independent partner will show opportunistic behavior. 
marketing and selling their cakes and desserts will not reveal secret recipes. In so, other words, can your supplier, can your agent steal your idea or steal your business from you, you know, somehow? An evaluation of the transaction-specific factors has also revealed an indication towards externalization. Let us move on to the fourth and final set of factors, the desired word characteristics. We will evaluate French Cake's wishes in terms of the main characteristics of the different types of entry modes. French Cakes have expressed that they can't afford to be too risky. They have no desire to be in complete control of the operation. They see the UK adventure more as a first and trial and error step in their internationalization process. Therefore, they are also very keen on a high level of flexibility so that they are able to... Okay, they want to learn how to export, they want to learn how to join, you know, how to do this, so they're very flexible. They don't need to have so much control. Maybe they have packaged products, maybe some of the, like the bakery goods that you see in Family Mart, for example. Uh, risk averse, yes, because we don't want to waste a lot of money. So, at the end, They'll look at all these factors and uh, probably determine that it's better to use an agent for the first uh, stage of their international development. Okay, I think that's a good video because it kind of gives you some ideas about the different factors that are influencing the decisions. Um, now, uh, in our book, I want to go through the first page here. Uh, and talk and look at the second part of our syllabus because our syllabus then says rationale and also benefits. What benefits do you get from a strategic alliance? Page 43. A strategic alliance is when two or more businesses form a partnership for a project, a business venture, or for the long term to create a new business. <clears throat> Strategic alliance is a strategy of collaboration, working together, co-together, labor, work, <clears throat> between businesses for mutual benefit, money. An alliance should bring income to alliance partners that would not otherwise occur. So it should be something that has a better benefit than not doing anything. The business in a strategic alliance share customers, possible, resources, possible, but not always, staff, also, and operational elements. The aim for alliance partners is to create some synergy in the alliance that makes it better than the individual companies and hopefully to create a competitive advantage that is greater than they can have on their own. So it's a business opportunity for both sides. So in this case, I think uh, it's a weird word, <coughs> but you'll probably Maybe see it. Synergy. 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 Definition of synergy. The synergy definition is when there's. Yeah, that's not the best one. Can we have a better example of synergy? That was terrible. Merriam Webster? That's the best definition of synergy? Come on, man. You can do better than that. We'll do this one. <clears throat> this one is better. The interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect that is bigger than the sum of the parts. So you get, you know, you put more together, you put two parts together and it makes something bigger. That's obvious. But that's what synergy means. Strategic alliances enable businesses to gain competitive advantage by sharing not only resources, potential uh, new products and new markets, also, but also customers, databases, target markets, 
knowledge, contacts, technology, capital, and people. Sometimes the money is the only thing that's needed from outside and someone inside the country has a good business idea. So that's also a strategic alliance, some kind of direct investment. Small or new businesses, they form strategic alliances in order to benefit from access to one, the established channels of distribution, marketing and brand reputation of a business that's already in that market, in some cases. Established businesses enter alliances to increase their capability for geographic expansion, in other words, market share. Cost reduction, economies of scale. And manufacturing, cost savings as well. So, uh, of course, you can put the benefits into all of those things. Strategic alliances are often formed between businesses that are based in different regions of the world, which can be good unless you're dependent on this medicine or you're dependent on these face masks for your doctors. The reason why America does not have enough medical equipment or resources or uh, face masks to deal with the COVID-19 case is because everything they do is short-term profit oriented. Everything is about making money in the last month or quarter. So if you tell someone you're going to save, I don't know, 600 million face masks for a rainy day, the investor says, where's the profit in that? Why should I invest in a rainy day when I can make money today? And then you have no face mask. So, it's an issue. It's an issue. So, let's look at these advantages. These would be on a question on our syllabus, of course, um, that asks about the benefits of strategic alliances, advantages. Quick access to a new market. Saves time. Benefit. Reduction of competition, sometimes by forming an alliance with a competitor. So instead of going into a new market and trying to take someone's market share, you join forces and you become the Avengers in that market and you don't have as much competition. None of this uh, civil war, you know. Um, Larger market share possibilities, of course, but that, you know, that's for each individual market and it depends on the product, if it's a niche or mass market. Sales and income, the answer to all of the world's problems would be increased. Gaining new expertise in technology, it's possible that you will, but it's also possible that you're going to give up access to some of your technology and expertise into the local market it may not benefit you. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. <clears throat> Access to research and development, maybe, maybe. It's the same problem as new technology. Uh, increase in the range of products and services. Um, that means you get to experiment with new products in a new market. Maybe you'll learn something that you can apply to other markets. Next one, the opportunity to share operating costs and working capital. So if you have an alliance, you share the risk. So that can be good. In some, uh, if you go alone, you have all the risk. If you have an alliance, you share some risk. But you also have to trust each other. Um, next one, very important, maybe the most important, access to established distribution channels. Anybody who enters a new market is going to find out that one of the hardest things to do is to figure out how to get your product into the shops. And that everybody knows everybody in the old market, in the new market, and that you don't know anybody. And you kind of need somebody to help you gatekeep to enter that distribution process and channels. Uh, of course, you can gain knowledge about the customers and the culture that might help you with your promotional strategy. 
and you'll also have a greater global brand. And so when people travel from country to country, they might acknowledge you as a global brand. And if you have good quality control, they might recognize you <clears throat> as kind of a standard for uh, whatever product you're selling because you're an international brand with a specific level of quality which customers understand. So, uh, those are the good points. Now you can imagine what strategic alliance is. The first thing is uh, you're going to imagine is uh, less control. Right? Uh, in a strategic alliance, if you get together with another partner, you might find out that you are dealing with their problems, right? You may take on the weaknesses of your partner if they have some kind of management problems or staff problems or costs that you didn't know about. And you form some kind of acquisition if you take them over and you become responsible for them then you might have to be responsible for their costs and debts. Communication is uh, going to be important and that communication is not just about doing the communication, it's about the cross-cultural understanding of how to communicate, what is the right way to communicate and make decisions as well. Decision-making power is going to be uh, part of that communication and some countries have different styles of decision making. And that's the next one. Increased conflict, possibly over decision making, and also how the business resources should be allocated. <clears throat> I had one partnership with, um, with a Vietnamese uh, partner, and uh, we uh, had pretty much every problem. It, it should have worked. I should have made lots of money from that. Uh, we were opening up an IELTS school. I invested in the school. I was supposed to be the manager at the school. I was the kind of management style where I hired people to do things and I expected them to be done and I didn't need to sit there behind a desk for 40 hours to make things work. Things were working. However, even though I agreed to open up a branch in Saigon of this school, they wanted to open up a second branch in Hanoi. So we would have two schools, same name, two branches, Saigon, Hanoi. <clears throat> two different markets, <coughs> completely different markets. Here, they wanted to focus on IELTS. There, they had kids' classes too. Totally different market. <clears throat> Investment in uh, Hanoi is different. Uh, the staff management in Hanoi is totally different. The marketing strategy in Hanoi is totally different. In Hanoi, so much of the customers that you find are based on um, uh, relationship marketing, who you know. In Saigon, you can operate as a, as, a, as a regular market, right? You can have a product, market it well, people will check you out if they have a reputation, or if you get a good reputation, <coughs> customers will share with one another what you do well, and you can grow your customers. Communication, awful. <coughs> Cultural differences, awful. Decision making awful, the resources were enough to be successful in Saigon, but they were not successful enough to put up with all the Hanoi nonsense. I thought I was going to write curriculums for IELTS, and I was supposed to then write curriculums for kids in Hanoi. Not my specialty, not my idea. So I had to they died, they killed themselves by spreading themselves too far uh, not to mention accounting problems, but uh, I took some of my money out and I took my investment out of the company. So I lost some money, but not too much. But really, unbelievable, it should have worked if they just would have focused on one thing. But the cultural differences were very big and the decision making was not, I didn't, 
my decisions would be different. <clears throat> Making the alliance work takes time and energy away from the core business activities. Interestingly enough, I also had my job here at the same time that I had that school. Part of the thing that my partner, the Vietnamese partner had, she was like complaining that I was working here. And I said, look, I can't put all my eggs in your basket, you know. This is my career and I'm not going to give up something that's important. I can do both. I know I can do both. But I'm not going to just, you know, give in to, I'm not going to have all of my life be dependent on you, no. So, I would have taken, uh, yeah, I took some energy, I guess, away from my, my job or my, the other business because I had to work. So that's true, my focus was a mixed focus. <clears throat> Loss of control over product quality, operating costs, and employees. All of that stuff happened in Hanoi. They wanted to manage the, the, the school in Hanoi from Saigon. So I'm flying to Saigon to talk to these people who don't want to talk to me because, you know, he's the guy from Saigon. He doesn't know anything, number one. He doesn't know anything. That's the first thing. Any from Han from anybody from Hanoi. They, people, we don't know anything. So then, I'm a foreigner, so that's another reason. Third, um, you know, they basically, you know, they all know each other and they don't know me. Familiarity. So three reasons why when I go there, it's going to be difficult for me to communicate and manage those people. <clears throat> so, total failure. Totally annoying and sad. It should have been successful. We should have made pretty good money from that. Because IELTS was just in the right moment when it was blasting off. <clears throat> Alright, so those are some of the benefits and the risks involved in trying to establish um, a strategic alliance. I will uh, talk about uh, exporting you know, now. Um, I just want to. I'm going to talk about export risk later, not right now, <coughs> but uh, because export is a bit risky. But I'll just introduce the. the I mean, we know what it means, right? There's different ways to export. The two main ways are to use international shipping and marketing tools such as Amazon, you can sell um, eBay as well, or Lazada, or uh, Alibaba. Alibaba is more of a bad and C, uh, it's a wholesale company. So <clears throat> there are many different um, basic ways that you can ship things to other countries that would allow you to at least sell to customers in that market. Those are very basic, I would call that, uh, it's not even, yeah, it's more like shipping than it is exporting, but it, it technically is. <clears throat> you might have taxes. Uh, the secondary level of exporting is when you actually have uh, Mr. Thompson from this video that we saw in England, and this guy, he is gonna be your agent in that country. Where are you, Mr. Thompson? Are you here? There he is, Mr. Thompson. Holding a flag and your money. So it's an agent, someone who's going to help you to uh, import into that country. So that's more formal and it's contractual. But that's the most basic, basic, basic ways of entering a product market. So. Um, our book wants to talk about um, uh, outsourcing next, so I'll talk about outsourcing for a few minutes. Um, and then in the next class, we'll go on to mergers and acquisitions, <coughs> which is complicated a little bit. Outsourcing. So, um, the main thing to remember about outsourcing is that it's functional. It revolves around function. So if you were going to do a case study about strategic alliances and you wanted to talk about outsourcing, you might mention it. Well, you should mention which 
part of the business functions or operations you're going to outsource. Um, last year, we had a um, we looked at uh, business structures. Last year it was the first semester. <clears throat> Functional organizational structures. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, these very basic examples. Um, but, you know, you might outsource in a new country any of these. Production, your HR department, who's going to do your selling for you, maybe your accountants, or your, not your finance so much, R&D department, maybe there's someone local who's good at doing market research for you, uh, or purchasing, for example. There are other examples. Marketing department, obviously, R&D. Um, but those are functions, right? So HR, uh, the IT department might be different. So depending on <clears throat> what you need in that new market or which part of your experience is weakest when you go to a new market, that might be a case or a rationale, okay? So if you wanted to frame it in BME language, you would say one rationale for hiring an advertising company, company in a new market or a new country would be that our company does not understand uh, how to reach the customers through advertising or um, what kind of cultural differences we need to take into account when marketing our and promoting our products or services. Rationale, that's perfect, right? What's the reason for it? Lack of experience in that market. <clears throat> so when you think of outsourcing, don't just think about production, even though it's probably the most common uh, you know, form of what we consider outsourcing. Uh, and our book is not great on this, actually. <clears throat> This video looks like it'll be bad. I forget. It's been a year. Outsourcing. Is it good? What a simple language. Is it good or bad? If it's more than five minutes, I'm not going to show it. It's exactly five minutes. Mm. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'll go through this part of the chapter first, though. Outsourcing is a strategy that involves, I'm on page 44 by the way, outsourcing is a strategy that involves using a company overseas to perform a business function. This is different to offshoring, where companies use their own employees or hire employees in different locations around the world. A business in Australia can use an overseas company that specializes in a certain function. They have well-trained staff and efficient operations that can perform the function on a contract basis more cheaply than a company doing it themselves. So, no, you know this already, but that's done on a contract basis. So, in other words, it's in order to be fulfilled. It's not, uh, you're not managing them. You just order what you order. You get what you get from based on what you order. It's like a menu, um, and there's a contract involved. Examples of work Australian businesses are contracting overseas include game development, so that's R&D, engineering, uh, for people who are on the ground in a certain area, they might be able to understand engineering that area better, design, uh, mobile app development, but there, this is talking about um, and human resources, that's better. Human resources and payroll. Um, this is really, uh, so yeah, okay, so you can enter a new market using outsourcing or you can uh, outsource your local uh, business functions to another country and save money. But we're really talking about entering a new market mostly with this section. 
An Australian business can access local knowledge and expertise by outsourcing its legal function in the target country. If I go to Vietnam, I don't understand anything about Vietnamese law. I need a Vietnamese lawyer outsourcing. Uh, they also may be able to lower costs by using labor in countries that have lower wages. That's the most popular version of outsourcing. Stable and reliable communication technology provides access to locations around the world. That has nothing to do with outsourcing. India is one of the largest providers of outsourcing services in the world. Again, this is about a company that needs customer service in Australia hiring a company in India to outsource uh, this uh, function of the business. That's outsourcing, but for our purposes right now, we're talking about expanding overseas, so it's not really totally related to our expansion of our company. So, I don't know. They're talking about, yes, there are highly qualified English speakers in India. True. The impact on employment and outsourcing, we all know this. This is the tenth time that they've said this, but it's really not related to the syllabus, is that employment in Australia will go down and there will be new jobs in other countries. So, I, I don't know why they include this here. I'm going to talk about acquisitions and mergers in the next video, but I'll let this play for a minute. I think it's not so bad, but I'm not sure. Let me check. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to present our video about outsourcing. Is it good or bad? I will explain the nature of outsourcing companies in general and provide this scenario for one of the existing outsourcing companies in Kuala Lumpur. I hope at the end of the video you can provide your feedback. For the reason of privacy, let's name the company as an ABC company. Now let's begin with our first discussion. What is outsourcing? Generally, outsourcing means using external resources or getting help from the outside of the organization. There are many big companies who outsource their businesses, such as Apple, Nike, HP, and many others. They will choose a location where labor is very cheap, but the skill of human capital is relatively acceptable. Countries such as China, India, Philippines, Malaysia are the most targeted by the big companies. And in order to outsource, they need a partnership with an outsourcing company to help them. This is where ABC Company plays their role. The company is a global outsourcing company for sales, services, and support. We can say that they are one of the fast-growing outsourcing companies in Malaysia. They manage to have partnerships with companies like Microsoft, Google, and HP. We can say that it's a very good achievement to maintain high clients like that, isn't it? So how does an ABC company actually work? To elaborate more, let's move to the second discussion, the clients. Let's take Microsoft as an example. Microsoft trusted ABC Company to help them hire and manage the inside sales representatives. Not only ABC Company will have to find human capital, but at the same time they will be the one who decide the salary package, including the employees' benefits. In return, Microsoft will ask for high sales results from the employees hired by the ABC Company. Now before Microsoft decides to outsource, there are a few reasons why they do so. First is time. Theoretically, nobody has the time to do everything. Therefore, we should seek help from someone to get the job done. Second is money. It takes a lot of time and money to find additional resources. Many big companies use cost efficiency as a reason to outsource their businesses. The third factor is importance. Sometimes we just have to focus on the main and more important things so it doesn't get all jumbled up. The final factor is skills. Outsourcing gives organizations the chance to find someone outside the organization to bring in the skills required. But outsourcing is not always as good as it sounds. Yes, the client might save costs for their businesses, they might save time to finish their target performance, and the outsourcing company will get huge profits while providing very low salaries package to the employees. Now we'll move on to the most important discussion, the employees. It is not common news that when a person works at an outsourcing company, they will get less salary, not so amazing benefits, and usually will end up with bad management. The same goes with ABC company. 
There's a lot of negative feedback in the management and the low salary issue was done by the employees. High attrition is unavoidable, and many people say that the company is hiring unqualified managers. Ah, uh, this is not great. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not good. We're talking about entering a new market. We're not talking about saving money so much. Um, but, uh, of course, outsourcing, the you know, either someone has to be able to do it better than you, or they have to be able to do it cheaper than you, or cheaper and better than you. Those are the reasons why we choose to outsource things. All right, that's the beginning of Strategic Alliances. Tomorrow we're going to talk, or Thursday we'll talk more. Bye.